Hey there, Benders! Welcome to Versus Shorts, the series where I take two characters and set them against each other in open combat. Today, we will pit Unalak of the Northern Water Tribe against Mingwa, the Waterbender from the Red Lotus. For this video, I will be observing these characters as shown in the Legend of Korra TV series, Book 2 and 3, respectively. This round is a bit unfair. If Unalak and Mingwa were without water, and we were judging purely on the basis of their physical prowess, Mingwa is at a massive disadvantage. She was born with no arms, and could only make herself combatively viable with the use of her water bending, just as Toph could only make herself combatively able through Earth. But as it stands, this round highlights the pure physical capabilities of each character, to which Unalak, a middle-aged man who was in perfect health, gets the decisive edge. Unalak tends to be underestimated for his bending power because of his subtlety. His bending wasn't always the largest or most dominating, but definitely precise and minimal, only using large amounts of water as a finisher rather than an opening gambit. His greatest achievement was his spirit bending of course, able to pacify and control dark spirits, but in a bender versus bender scenario, this has no application outside the spirit world. He was definitely a master waterbender, creating massive water spouts, whips, ice daggers, and all the other talents that come with the territory, taking on multiple opponents as well as the avatar. Much like Toph, Mingwa's disability actually enhanced her ability with her respective element, as she was more reliant on it. Where most waterbenders needed the physical movements of their arms to achieve their waterbending attacks, Mingwa only used her torso and her hips, asserting a deep and intimate control of the element. Because of this, she was quite possibly the best practitioner of the water whip technique. The strength of her whips were such that she could carry herself and Pali without breaking her connection, and the dexterity of her whips were such that her physical agility was greatly enhanced. While Unalak was a master waterbender who was ultimately aware of the flow and connection of water, he does not live with it like Mingwa does. For Unalak, water was a tool, while Mingwa used it as a livelihood. In a contest of water, even if Unalak does manifest an advantage, Mingwa will still come back with more and more strength, much like her fight with Kaya in the Northern Air Temple. But Unalak would not be dominated by Mingwa in the same way he was not dominated by Korra. He has displayed that he can deal with multiple attack vectors used against him, so Mingwa's octopus technique would not be a total trump card. In short, I think they are effectively equals as waterbenders, but the slight edge is determined by the connection to water each of them has. And with that, Mingwa has the advantage, and a blow-for-blow -blow contest of water between the two, that my new connection would be the slight determining factor and about decided by inches. Mingwa gets the slight edge for her bending abilities. It might be easy to say that Unala clearly defeats Mingwa by way of the transitive property. After all, he beat the combined strength of Mako and Bolin, while Mingwa was defeated by Mako on his own. However, the issue with the transitive property with regards to plot-driven fights, especially with regards to waterbenders, is the lack of variables and circumstances that are calculated within it. Mingwa was defeated for three reasons. Location, location, location. Waterbenders are perhaps the most circumstantial fighters in the series. Mingwa had no way to replenish the water that was evaporated by Mako, and when she overcompensated with a cavern lake, she was simply electrocuted. And the same would have occurred had Unalak found himself in the same situation. Both Unalak and Mingwa were highly tactical fighters, as most waterbenders were, using their defense to flow into their offense. Unalak was certainly the more defensive fighter of the two, and Mingwa was more inclined for aggression. But Unalak was perhaps the most viable in a technical sense, picking apart his opponent through nuance, countering their assaults, rather than getting caught up in his own. Because of this, I feel as though he gives himself more options in combat. Mingwa does not simply throw caution to the wind, but the nature of her bending requires flamboyant movement centered around her hips to function. Again, the difference between the two is minimal, but in this regard, Unalak has the advantage, with more options to exploit against Mingwa whether by way of his water whips, ice daggers, environmental manipulation, or freeform waterbending. Unalak gets the slight edge for his tactical abilities. If 
these two former allies ever met in open conflict, if Unalak survived and Minghua escaped prison, who would come out on top? Let's set up this fight. Let's say it takes place in the Southern Water Tribe villages. The following is a hypothetical explanation of the possible outcomes. In the early fight, I see Minghua taking a 1-0 advantage. Not so much because Unalak would be outright dominated, but because Minghua would start out more aggressive while he would take a measure of her. Though I find this to be an unlikely scenario, if Unalak attempts to meet that aggression with his own, he will be in for a losing battle. In the mid-fight, it would be more equal with a 2-2 split. Unalak would quickly realize that his physical advantage would be completely negated by Minghua's waterbending, which enhances her dexterity, but his superior ability to pick apart his opponent would bridge the gap. Even with Minghua's octopus form, he'd be able to subvert her with ice daggers and walls. But like a proper waterbender, she would retaliate in kind, empowering herself through Unalak's own water-based attacks. In the late fight, I see Unalak taking a 3-1 advantage, with his greater use of his environment being a key factor. Minghua focuses on using her entire body and her whips to defeat her foes, but hardly ever manipulates the environment to her advantage. This could simply be explained by her nature of her specific brand of no-arm bending. She is required to make large movements to compensate, rather than alter her surrounding area. She was a top-tier user of the water whip technique, but that was it, never displaying any other skill besides water spouts. Of all the scenarios, I see this ending in the late fight. Though Unalak would likely be taken aback by Minghua's initial assault, mostly due to his more measured approach to a fight, he would turn the fight to his favor the longer the engagement lasted, making superior use of his environment with subtle but deadly execution. Minghua would not make it easy. Her agility was quite substantial, especially in her octopus form. Unalak would not overtake her by way of a water whip. In fact, if he tries this tactic, I see him losing in the early or mid fight. But I find it more likely for Unalak to catch her with an ice dagger through the chest in a long form bout. And thus, after a 5 to 10 advantage with a late fight edge, Unalak, the chief of the north, would be the most likely victor. Of course, this is all my opinion based on the lore of Avatar. Do you agree that Unalak would take a majority victory, or do you believe the Red Lotus Waterbender is the most likely victor? Let me know in the comments below, and as always, peace, love, and be water my friends.